You're listening to the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode number 84. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Van Delden and once a week we talk to an industry expert from the wool industry supply chain from farm to fashion and beyond, delivering strategies and insights to be successful in wool and showcasing those beautiful stories wool has to tell. Today's guest is Lorenz Tjet. Lorenz is the product development manager of Dale of Norway. In It's a Norwegian knitwear brand. Welcome, Lorenz. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. Hope you're fine as well. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would like you to ask you to just introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the work that you do. Yeah. Uh, again, my name is Lorenz, and for the moment, I'm working in the product development. I'm 55 years old, father of three grown childs, and living in the area around Dale. I've been working in a factory since 1980. I did my education in Germany from 85 to 87, and since that, I've had different positions in production, development, and sales. And also tell us a little bit more about the Dale of Norway um, and also about your products. Yeah. Dale of Norway was East earlier a part of the old Dale factory established in 1879. It was organized as a separate company in 1990. The company has produced many things, but uh, we are focusing on the Norwegian Uh, sweaters in 100% wool. In all the days, it was the heavy Norwegian sweater in Norwegian wool. Today, we also make uh, thinner garments in uh, nice merino wool as well. Norwegian pattern is very important as a signature for a dollar product. Yeah, and I think we will talk a little bit more about um, the patterns later on. But first, tell me a little bit more about um, the history of the company, because it, it started already many years ago. Yeah. Mr. Peter Jepsen, the founder of Factory, he came from Schleswig. I think at that time it was Denmark, today Germany. He came to Norway around... 1850, with the dream to build uh, uh, textile production. He first started a factory outside Bergen in Arna. He bought a river down there and uh, went to England and learned about textile production. He came back and established uh, the company there. He also got big in shipping. As far as I know, he very soon built up 150 ships And he was the pioneer of uh, the steam boats here in Norway. He was also a politician. So he was sitting three period in the Norwegian government under the Swedish king. And um, he was also consul for Germany. So he was quite a busy man. He also had 25 children. Um, wow, that's a lot. He was <laughs> as much, yeah. <laughs> He's a busy man. And uh, he was also... I think a lot of communication and railroad was the big thing in uh, the 1800s. So um, he was looking to opportunities to freight his goods from Bergen to Oslo and to Sweden, where his market was. And he loaned in which state, uh, I think, 200,000 kroner. That will be, uh, yeah, let's say, 25,000 euro at that time. To, to start building the railroad between Bergen and Voss. And when he would find the route, he came to Dale, saw a river here, really big, and he saw the potential to build a factory in Dale. So in 1879, the first factory was here. And they produced everything from cotton fabric, wool fabric. In 1911, they built the first combat yarn mill in Dale, where our history goes back to with the knitted garments. Uh, the, we lived from yarn sale and making a pattern up to 
1967 when we bought knitting machines and also knitted finished garments. So that's uh, a part of our history. Okay, that that's very impressive. And you also have been working with Dale of Norway for quite a long time. So how did you get started in the company? Um, my father was a principal in the local school. And he always told me from when I was young that you need to do a, make education. That's the only way to be happy. So I choose to show him that... Uh, I will not do that. I will be a normal worker. So when I needed a trainee in the knitting department in 1980, I found out that fit my strategy, strategy very well. I applied on the job and I started to work in a company. I found uh, working with uh, textile, design, technology, and everything was really, really fun and interesting. So I worked uh, for five years in the production Then I went to Reutlingen in Germany and did two years education there before I went back and again, I worked in different positions. Yeah. And when you started, you were 16 years old. If I... Yeah, I was 17 years ah, old 17. at that time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and my father also studied in Reutlingen in Germany, so I'm sure you got a very good oh, education there. <laughs> yeah, he also yeah. studied textile yeah. engineering. So. Okay. And yeah, I would say uh, it was a really great time these two years in Reutlingen. Okay. That's uh, excellent. Was and fantastic you proved your father correct, but you also benefited. Yeah, <laughs> fathers very often uh, are wise people, and uh, they are always correct. So when I try to advise my children as well, they come back and say, "Daddy, you might have it right." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good that you have the same experience now that you're older as well <laughs> and yeah I also read on your website that many of the Dale employees have been working for the company for a very long time even sometimes the parents and the grandparents have worked in the company so is there a reason for this being the case um, and how is it important for the company as well yeah um First of all, the earlier Dale was in the middle of nowhere. He didn't have a road into Dale before 1958. So either people was working in the company or they left the Dale. So it was very common that uh, the earlier we had the third or fourth generation of workers uh, in the company. Uh, one of the girls in the product development, she is, I think, the fourth generation of a, a textile producer in Dale. So she stayed here. And uh, it was a safe. You got a job, you got education within the company, and you got a salary. Uh, nowadays, uh, the road to Bergen takes 50 minutes, so many people are now working in Bergen, living in Dale or Stanghelle, where I live. Uh, yeah, uh, the good thing with people that have worked in uh, in production, they are used to working different working times, and they used to produce, and that has been very important for the company over many many years. The culture. Yeah, and, and there's a lot lot of knowledge, I guess, also then handed down from generation to generation. Yeah, a lot of knowledge and. Uh, but the most important thing is the culture. Because uh, Dale was in the middle of nowhere, we need to solve everything locally. And that culture we still have. And I think that's one of the reasons that the Dale of Norway is still produced in Dale. Mm -hmm. If something's happened, you need to solve it, we solve it. We find a solution. <laughs> Okay, it sounds, that sounds very practical. And I understand that in the past, Dale of Norway was um, turned, or it used to be more of a conservative brand, and now it is perceived quite as a modern, relevant, and urban chic, chic brand. So what was key to turning the brand to, and making it relevant for to, today's consumers? Yeah, 
the way people was wearing clothes has changed a lot because of uh, of new technical solutions. Uh, when we go 50 years or even only 30 years back, a thick sweater could be a outer layer product. Today you have um, yeah lightweight uh, practical jackets, so you don't need the the warmth of the very thick wool. And we saw that in the 90s, we were very big and heavy garments, maybe also windstoppers. But we saw that the sale went down. We also saw that the, a lot, a lot of pattern was out of fashion. So we needed to adjust. And then we went to first to middleweight products, later on to really lightweight products. And um, less pattern, but always with a pattern or a dollar signature that was important. So uh, we went from uh, skis products and to office products, uh, also into products where people can wear in parties. We have a we have one garment called Christiania. It's a lady jacket. I, when I was showing this to customers, I always said that I'm thinking about the movie for wedding and a funeral. It was a really great movie. And um, you could, that product you can wear in all occasions, only to be nice. You can wear it in a party or even in a funeral. So you can be classic and nice in such a garment. And uh, this is a garment you also, also could wear for years and years because of the quality. Yeah, and I think that's more and more important that people or consumers want yeah, versatile garments that, yeah, as you said, you can wear to any occasion. Last year, that Dale of Norway was sold to the Rossignol group. And how is that important for the brand and to, how to develop further? Yeah, I would think I would say like this, Dale is a small factory with a big brand name. Name. We are selling quite well in Europe. We are selling also quite well in North America and of course in Norway. But we don't have really the resources to bring the brand out to the world, the Far East. Uh, there we could think there we think that was you know, could help us to yeah fulfill the potential in our brand of course you all know, have their knowledge and we also have our knowledge and we will also produce garments for what's you know. so we both see potentials in production and in distribution um, yeah, and I think it shows that it's always necessary to constantly be changing to be relevant and to leverage the potential of a brand. And I also heard that, um, I mean, you just explained that you manufacture in Norway and I and you also use a lot of uh, Norwegian wool in your products. And what are the challenges, but also maybe the opportunities with this kind of a setup? Uh. The challenge, of course, could be uh, the cost. But the opportunity is that we are close to the market. And the last three years, we've changed a lot the setup in the company, how we are selling and how we are planning and how we are producing. Because uh, more or less everybody are producing in the Far East, and they are buying on prognosis and pre-orders. Uh, and uh, we could, uh, or we do changes in our plans every week and fit our plans into the sale. So if we are getting a big order on a specific style, yeah, we can produce it within six weeks. So, um, Earlier, we had uh, up to 80% pre-orders and 20% reorders. Today, we are, have less than 50% pre-orders. And then we're telling the customers, if you have success, 
we could provide you with more garments. So we have really grown a lot the last three years because of this. So you're able to react uh, more quickly to the demand? We can react within uh, mm -hmm. six to ten weeks. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And, I mean, do you only use wool in your products or also other fibers? And then maybe explain what role does wool play in the in the brand? No. For us, it has been important to deliver natural fiber. And wool is a really a good fiber also for the environment. Uh, in Norway, the sheep are keeping the mountains clean from the trees and everything. And um, we are eating the meat and we are, they are, they are using the wool. So um, we are saying that we will produce only 100% wool. We, can, we see now that the demand of a special merino wool are increasing. So um, I think the price has more than doubled in the last eight years. What's happening in the future, we don't know, but we're trying to stick on 100% wool. Yeah. And wool in Norway, we have used for yeah, thousands of years. It's important for us. And uh, the synthetics are not so yeah, loved in Norway. And we're trying to sell this to the world. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that that I love and I can I support. <laughs> um, and yeah, earlier you mentioned that the Norwegian sweater patterns are important and indeed they're world famous. Can you tell us a little bit more about the history behind these Norwegian sweater patterns? How did they develop? Uh, have they certain meanings, etc.? Yeah. We have had the pattern traditions uh, at least five, six hundred years, but I think they are actually not Norwegian, I think. I think uh, if you go even further back, the Vikings was traveling people. I don't think they were so nice, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, they were traveling around the world, and, uh, and uh, you can find the same pattern in uh, Russia, in uh, Turkey, in the Far East. But I think we have made these Norwegian. Maybe the most <coughs> uh, known pattern, Setestal, that uh, goes 500 years back to an area in Norway. And uh, when the wife was knitting the Setestal pattern, it had some crosses over the chest. And the symbolic on that was that these crosses would protect the children and the husbands against the devil and so on. So at that time, it has meaning. Different areas in Norway have different patterns. You have a more fishing-like pattern. You have a, a sultra pattern outside Bergen. You have a sauna pattern outside Bergen. So every area has their own pattern. But I think uh, companies like Dahle has made the Norwegian pattern world famous and we have made all the, the patterns Norwegian, even if we can find the same symbolic in other countries. Okay, so yeah, so you exported yeah, the pattern to the world and made it popular. <laughs> And yeah. yeah, especially uh, around Lillehammer Olympic Games, then it just exploded. Yeah. For us. Yeah. Oh yeah, that yeah, that's interesting. But that brings me to the next topic, as you mentioned, the Olympic Games. Um, yeah, Dale of Norway is the supplier to to the Norwegian Olympic team since 1956. Um, how did this come about that you supplied Olympic team with garments? Uh, <coughs> Yeah, after the, the World War II, the company, Dahle Factory, grew a lot. Uh, they didn't sell fabrics, they just distributed and measured their success and how much do we produce. But the people back then knew that things will change, imports will come in the 60s and so on, so they needed to start brand building. So Dahle Factory was the first sponsor for the 
Olympic team. And we made a Cortina sweater. The fun thing is that we are still producing that style. Why that agreement back in 56 was important for us, that made it possible for us to join the Lillehammer Olympic Games with a sweater. And that opened the world as a market for Dahl of Norway. So it was really a good decision back in the 50s. And I think that's one of the main reasons that Dahl of Norway, our company, producing Dahl today. Okay, so a very important milestone there. And I'm just very curious. So each, every four years, you have to come up with a new um, design for the Olympic team. And how is this process actually happening? Do many people get to, to have a say in it? Um, do the sports uh, representatives say if they like it? Tell me a little bit how, how the designs are developed. During the time we have done it differently, but uh, the last 10, 15 years, it is the design department in Dala are making the designs. And very often uh, we are looking into the history of the city which are arranging the Olympic Games and uh, trying to find inspiration from that area. Uh, this year it's for not that easy to to do so. So we we did a different way. We looked back in our ski history and found a, a pattern, very old ski pattern, uh, uh, ski sweater pattern, and we used that at the base. And then we built a new and really really nice design called Olympic Passion. Yeah, we put the Norwegian flag on over a heart and. Uh, Got some snow in it, and, and that was a way to do it. Uh, but of course, the sales department, the managing group, and everything, everybody has a saying in how the design should look like. Also, the athletes who have to wear it, then do they can they say something? No, no the <laughs> athletes does not. Uh, the only thing they they are very often in television. In studio, and they're hot, so they was not so very fond of the very thick, heavy sweaters anymore. So the last uh, eight years, we have used uh, thinner merino wools in these products. Okay, so you you listened to their feedback and had them out. Yes, of course. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much, Lorenz, for your time. I really found it fascinating to learn more about Dale of Norway and. How, what ro role wool plays. If people want to find out more about Dale, where should they go? Where can they find more information? Uh, they could uh, look into our website, www.dale.no. Uh, <clears throat> we also have uh, guided tours for groups in Dale, so they can come to our shop and get guided tours into the factory. Or they could find information also on web of course and people are very welcome to visit us <laughs> perfect yeah and i recommend everyone checking out the dale of norway sweaters i i am a happy customer i i have one sweater which i love and you're right you can wear it to all sorts of occasions and it has already lasted me very long and it um has no pilling at all and i even met uh, lately a a colleague who's a bit older and he bought his Dale of Norway sweater in the 1970s and it still looks as new and it looks perfect so you did a good job there thank you <laughs> okay thank you for your time Lawrence and all the best thanks Sam it was fun bye okay. bye, -bye. Hopefully you enjoyed my talk today with Lorenz Tvet from Dale of Norway. If you want to find out more about the company and also find all the links that were mentioned in today's show, then head on over to the show notes at elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 084. Once again, elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 084. I really enjoyed you listening today. Talk to you again next week and bye for now.